Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the uh, multi-stakeholder meeting and interactive meeting of the scaling up nutrition movement on the impact of the uh, global food and nutrition crisis on what is happening in your country. We are organizing this um, uh, interactive uh, meeting because we want to hear from you. We want to hear how you are anticipating uh, and preventing uh, um, um, the, uh, uh, the biggest uh, uh, risks. We want to learn from each other and we also want to get information to um, bring to the global level where um, the global decision makers are trying to de develop support uh, packages uh, that can be owned and driven further uh, by countries. Right, we have interpretation for those who are um, coming from French speaking countries. Down in your screen, you have a button, an icon where there is interpretation, uh, push that um, uh, icon and you can switch to French and, uh, and Spanish. We have four uh, introductions. First of all, uh, we will hear from David Laborde. Uh, Dr. David Laborde, he is a senior research fellow um, uh, from uh, IFPRI. Uh, then we will hear from Dr. Uh, Nwafour, and he is um, the vice president of policy uh, and on policy and state capability from AGRA, the African um, Green Revolution, um, Agricultural Green Revolution in Africa. Then we will hear the regional perspective from Gladys Mugambi, uh, Sun Movement Focal Point in Kenya. Then we will hear from Mary Perry, who is uh, the Sun Movement Focal Point in Ghana. Then we open the floor um, and we want to hear from you. There are two opportunities you can use. You can use the Q&A box that is next left um, uh, to the chat box. You can also use the chat box to say hello to each other. But if you have questions, use the Q&A box or you can raise your hand um, uh, because we also want you to speak up. So interaction, questions, uh, good suggestions, sharing your experience, that is what this event is all about. And now without further ado, uh, it is my honor as Sun Movement coordinator to give the floor to Dr. David Laborde. Mr. Laborde, you have the floor. Thank you very much uh, for this invitation and the pleasure to join uh, this discussion from, from the Sun Network. Um, I'm going to uh, cover quickly the three points, you know, what is the current dynamics on, on food markets and why there is a global concern on food security, what it means for countries around the world and, and what type of action uh, we, we, we expect uh, to have. And of course, uh, in four minutes and a half, I will not go into too many details. Just to say that uh, on, on the IFPRI website, if you are really interested by this crisis, we have a lot of blogs uh, covering both uh, country uh, specific issues and global issues. And uh, especially from the lens of nutrition, we had the, the, the pleasure, uh, including with you, to, to have this piece on, on in nature that talk about some of the issues and challenges. So why we have a concern? First is because even before this crisis, food prices were rising, fertilizer were rising, we went out of a major macroeconomic crisis with COVID-19. Uh, and even if, if some most advanced economy, people are already thinking that the COVID crisis is finished. Uh, actually, for other parts of the world, it's not the case. Uh, so that is imp uh, relatively important. And on top of that, uh, last year and even earlier this year, we also have negative climate shock that have impacted various uh, major food producer in the world, from uh, La Nina uh, hurting Latin America to uh, drought impacting North America or even Morocco. So food prices were rising, food insecurity was rising, and on the 24th of February, the uh, invasion of, of Ukraine by Russia has put an additional pressure. And in the news, you may of course have read a lot about wheat, and wheat is a key a product exported by both uh, Ukraine and Russia. And the Black Sea uh, has become a major source of, of food uh, product, in particular wheat, but also sunflower oil 
uh, in the recent uh, decade, I will say, for North Africa and, and uh, Western Asia and even part of uh, East and, and the Horn of Africa. Uh, and as you see on, on this graph, yes, the price of wheat have overreacted just after the crisis, then it gets corrected. Uh, but in the last uh, actually few days, because all around the world, uh, people have started to adjust it kind of not enough, the price is rising again because there is this really a concern that a part of the grain that is in Russia today would not reach the market in the coming month, that the future uh, harvest and planting decision in Ukraine is going to be impacted, and that the overall uh, situation uh, will continue to, to make quite difficult for, for Russia to uh, participate fully to uh, food markets. And the only thing I want really that you keep from this slide is, is actually not just a wheat story. All commodities went up. So on one hand, also corn went up and soybean went up and that had an impact on feed and the livestock sectors also around the world. And vegetable oil also have been very high due to the crisis, but also due to a less than optimal, I would say, policy response by various uh, countries like export restriction. And vegetable oil also is a part of food uh, nutrition and diversity, and we should not forget about it. Now, when you start to combine all of these different shocks coming from the macroeconomic situation, the food price increase, the very disruption of a global or regional value chain from COVID-19 or this specific crisis, you can see on this map that various countries in the world are exposed at different level of vulnerability. Uh, that can take different steps. So there's not a one size fits all story here. Uh, some countries are really a kind of short term problems. When for others, it's much more the availability of fertilizer and what it means for next harvest this year, but also for 2023, that is pretty important. And if you compare this map with the third country list, for instance, you will find that one fourth uh, of the, the third countries are in the most vulnerable categories or kind of immediate vulnerability. Then the bulk of it uh, is just in a situation where it's more the kind of medium term consequences of this increase of food price on the world market, but that will be translated just imperfectly to domestic situation. So that's what we have to monitor. And also the kind of fertilizer aspect that matters. And finally, you still have about 10% of the same country that are not even classified because we don't have enough data to really do this kind of overall analysis in real time and i think it's still important to raise so what do we need and i will conclude on that is of course there is a, a need on financial response to manage this crisis both at the macroeconomic level to make sure that country can uh, and vulnerable country can have access to the liquidity they need to buy their food energy and fertilizer to avoid the kind of situation that we see in sri lanka today or in lebanon becoming uh, more uh, even more frequent we also need to make sure that trade uh, is going to continue to operate and that sanctions uh, should not create more problem than, uh, than we already have. And it's not to be against sanctions, it's just also to make clear that the business sectors, in particular in low and middle income countries, have much more challenge to operate or understand sanction than companies in the most advanced economies. So there is a, and, you know, a kind of technical help to do also uh, on that to make sure that people can still continue to do business. Uh, and last but not least, there is a need to do targeted support both for producers and consumers with smart safety nets uh, in order to go through the crisis um, because otherwise we will have serious long-term consequences. And I hope that with the discussion, we can cover even more topics. Thanks a lot. Dr. Laborde, can you please repeat your final recommendation because um, you were you were moving a little bit, and you need to be a little bit closer to your micro, because we ex we are extremely eager to to get your recommendations right. Sorry. So my recommendation, the last one, is about targeted safety nets. That should target not only household and consumers, and I think we will also discuss you know, the kind of gender dimension on that, but also we will need to target some producers. Uh, especially when we are going to think about the fertilizer situation, because, because we lack fertilizer this year. So not everyone will have the fertilizer he or she wants to have. Now, it doesn't mean that we have to forget about them or also to use the fertilizer we have in an inefficient way. It's still important that 
the best producer get access to fertilizer. But for the others, we need to support them during this crisis. Okay, so that's my main recommendation. Yeah. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for this uh, uh, starting introduction. Very interesting. Um, please uh, stay tuned and uh, participants. It's still a growing number of participants. We like it. Welcome to this interactive event of the Scaling Up Nutrition Movement, multi-sectoral, multi-stakeholder. We want to hear from countries how at the country level you are dealing with the impact of the global food and nutrition uh, crisis. We just heard from Dr. David Laborde from uh, IFPRI. We're now gonna hear from Dr. Apollo Nwavor, um, um, uh, and he is from uh, Agra in, um, in uh, Africa. Then we will hear two country uh, perspectives and then we open the floor and want to hear from you. So please use the Q&A box or um, take note of the questions you want to uh, raise because I might give you the floor very soon. Um, Dr. Nafur, you have the floor for the next five minutes. Over to you. Thank you. Um, I, I guess uh, everyone can, can hear me. Um, I'm just gonna go straight uh, to uh, probably, um, you know, uh, um, a focus on the continent, but, you know, it actually, you know, uh, complements uh, as well what, um, or rather corroborates what uh, David had shared earlier in his pre first presentation. And, and thank you, David, that was that was really uh, uh, very good. Um, I think, first of all, for, for, for trade, for, uh, for trade, um, I think... Um, uh, Wait, wait a moment, please, uh, Dr. Nafor, um, because somebody has connected, but please mute your um, microphone. The microphone is left in your uh, screen, left down. Please mute this one. Uh, otherwise, it will be difficult to listen to Dr. Nafor. So Dr. Nafor, you, of course, need to open your, uh, or keep your micro open and please continue. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to to be sure that um, I, I'm well heard. Um, can can everyone hear me well? Loud and clear. Loud and clear. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Right. So uh, I'm just going to start by um, you know letting us uh, have an overview of um, uh, of of food uh, of the food trade uh, uh, bill that's in, um, in, in the continent. So far it's about, you know, 64 billion US dollars, um, you know, uh, as at 2020. And you'll see from the graph that it's actually rising. It's been rising, you know, uh, over the years. Uh, and um, with this crisis, it's likely to rise further. But I think what's important is that to note is that intra-Africa trade, you know, um, uh, was at 16 billion as at 2020 uh, and it is just 17% 17 of the uh, entire trade uh, uh, in the continent. But at least this gives us an overview of, you know, of the trade situation and the fact that Africa largely depends uh, on imports for, for food. Uh, this is just focused on food. Um, you see from this next slide that, you know, at, at a regional level, you can see the, um, the, the level of imports. But I think one key thing that we need to, notice that North Africa remains uh, the, the largest food importing region with about 46% of, of African imports uh, going there. Uh, the rest of, of the continent, you know, uh, imports, you know, less. Uh, Dr. Noapur, I'm sorry to interrupt. Your, your slide presentation is not moving forward. Um, um, perhaps you could reload the presentation and, and, and show it in slide view. Okay, let me see. Just Thank you very on. much. Thank you. Uh, let me see what the challenge is. Um, is it still there? Can you see it? Yeah, um, we are now at slide three. Okay, just one second. So is this, is this okay or do you still need me to put it in slide mode? If you could put it into slide mode so our audience can see it better in their smaller screens, that would be very, very helpful. Thank you so much. Is, is this okay now? 
if you could show it in slide view, it would be easier uh, for our audience to see it on the smaller screen, Zoom screen. Sure, actually I've put it in slide view. I'm wondering why it's, a, it's, so, it's showing on my screen in slide view. Just for a second, please. Uh, let me just see. There we go. This is excellent. Dr. Nafor, this is excellent. Please. Can you, can you see yeah. it now? Yeah, we can see, we can, no, we can see you now. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to put it in, in slide mode. Um, so I'm gonna share again. Uh, and there you go. Please let me know if you can see it now, if you can see the slides, and then I'm just gonna go back to slide, to slide share now, slide show, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Uh, apologies, but I think I've tried to fix that. So I hope it's showing well. Yeah, please continue. Okay, great. Um, so, um, um, you will see from the from this uh, graph that you know the, there are regional variations in food imports. The largest food import um, uh, in food importing region has always been North Africa. Um, it's you know followed by the West, West Africa, Western Africa, which has twenty one percent. You know, um, uh, um, you know, uh, and uh, the Central Africa, you know, with. Uh, 10 and then Eastern Africa with 15. I think that's the, the least import of foods um, within the, the continent is the Southern Africa region uh, with just about uh, uh, 8%. But you can see the 20 largest um, uh, 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 importing countries in the continent and Egypt remains uh, the largest with um, the 20th being Zimbabwe. And um, of course that's for obvious uh, 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 reasons. But also the, the fact that um, uh, imports of food are expected to increase over time uh, and rapidly because of the crisis, um, as well as the issues around, um, you know, untapped uh, potential markets um, in the in the region. Um, but there's also a problem with food production uh, in the continent because food production is increasing, but per capita, you know, for food um, is is stagnant um, uh, over time, and that's because of increasing population. But also that's because you know um, uh, there's uh, low technology for food production. There's also the issues around you know um, uh, 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 you know a very minimum number of uh, food producers who are able to you know ensure that uh, productivity increases, uh, and that's a challenge you know for for the continent. Um, for the Russia-Ukraine exports to Africa. We will, we will notice that you know um, uh, cereals are high. Um, the, the the food exports to Africa from uh, from from Russia and Ukraine, you know, for for wheat in particular, you know, is is about six billion dollars, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, on an annual basis. And you will see that you know wheat is usually uh, the highest of of the imports, you know, coming into uh, at the continent from, from Russia and Ukraine. Um, and as well as we see that, you know, uh, cereals overall represent 80% of the food trade that happens, you know, in the continent. Um, uh, and um, uh, uh, we, we, we see that um, of all the cereals, wheat is greatly impacted because of, you know, the, the, the crisis that we see. Um, we, we also know that, you know, uh, Russia and Ukraine's uh, exports of cereals to Africa, you know, on a regional basis, you, you see that um, for Russia in particular, you know, uh, Northern Africa imports, you know, about uh, 63% and Sub-Saharan Africa is about, you know, uh, 37. Uh, that's practically the same thing for, for Ukraine. But for the rest of the world, it's, it's, it flips. Sub-Saharan Africa it actually in, imports more you know, uh, than, uh, than uh, um, uh, uh, from, from the rest of the world than Russia and Ukraine. But that tells us a story. And it's, it's the fact that, you know, 
the impact will be felt generally, but we, we think that you know, from this uh, data, uh, the, 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 the region that will be worst hit you know, will be uh, at Northern Africa. But that is not to say Sub-Saharan Africa is not gonna go through a food crisis. In fact, it's happening now. And the reason is because you know, that same crisis is actually affecting the rest of Europe and the others who usually import into Sub-Saharan Africa you know, from importing. And that's because of shipping lines as well as you know, issues around logistics you know, and, and other support. Uh, as well as the fact that now that there's a crisis, um, you know, a number of countries are taking a protectionist approach, you know, actually to uh, to ensure that there's food at home first before you, you know, export food uh, to, to other parts of the world. Um, Dr. Lafour, um, technology is not on our side. We are still on slide three. Okay. We're still on slide three, is that? Yeah, and to all the participants, welcome to this event. Um, we will share the slides together with the recordings after this uh, event. So please be patient while Dr. Mafour is trying to tackle the technical um, hiccup. Apologies for this. I'm, I'm actually very... Um, Surprised that this is not moving. I don't know. It's it's working very okay. well. Okay, Doctor Mafour, my suggestion is the following: because we are running otherwise out of time, please um, tell your story um, because you're you 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 are able to explain it uh, to us um, without the slides uh, because it's it um, starts to be a little bit. If I, um, Gerda, if I can step in on the technical support, um, yeah. Doctor Mafour. Um, the, the issue might be you're using two monitors. So your presentation will need to be on the monitor uh, that you're using for Zoom or else it won't sync up. So that could be one of the technical issues. It appears you're using two screens. Okay. Okay, in this case, um, Dr. Mafor, my suggestion is that we first go to one of the other uh, panelists then come back to you because then you might have sorted this. Ah, here we go. Is, is, can it, is it? Yeah. Can you see the presentation now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, great. Um, sorry, sorry, colleagues, about this uh, a technical hitch, I'm sure. Um, so this is better now, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know, but. Um, Slide three um, was, this was slide three, where I talked yeah. about the top 20 countries. Um, slide four talks about, you know, um, the, the food production, that food production has increased, but per capita remains stagnant. Uh, and the key issue here is that, you know, uh, food production has been rising in Africa, you know, with a growth of about 10% between 2014 and 2019. And this has mostly been driven, you know, by um, area expansion rather than productivity improvement, you know, um, and, and we need to note that. But, you know, per capita food production, you know, has actually been on the decline. And this is, a, you know, this is what is also causing uh, food security concerns um, in the continent. Um, on, on, on the next slide, which I hope you can all see now, you is just showing you an overview of the uh, Russia Ukraine exports to Africa. You will see that um, um, you know uh, cereals are going to be largely affected because uh, the continent um, imports cereals you know of, of about six billion you know um, uh, you know uh, uh, annually, and cereals represent eighty percent of the food trade um, uh, imports you know um, in, in 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 the continent. Um, you know, and amongst the cereals, wheat remains number one because um, wheat um, constitutes, uh, um, you know, about uh, uh, 4.9 billion uh, worth of imports amongst the 6 billion uh, cereals food imports um, uh, into, into the continent. So this is actually going to have a very huge um, a negative impact, you know, um, uh, uh, in, in the continent. Um, on the next slide, I share with us very quickly um, the, the exports of cereals to Africa. You see that um, a, 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 on a whole, um, the rest of the world, um, you know, uh, imports 
um, uh, imports uh, um, uh, cereals to Africa to the which makes up about uh, um, you know 79% of of cereals imports into the continent. But from Russia and Ukraine, it's just about 21% of the cereals imports. But you see. That's not, um, you know, all, all that there is to it. It's, it's the fact that, you know, um, uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, you know, accounts for more than double of cereals imports from Russia and, and Ukraine uh, to the continent. Uh, and that says a lot about um, availability of food uh, uh, going forward. A few things to note um, around uh, uh, production, you know, um, uh, and, and um, uh, trade in the continent is that, you know, the, the conflict, you know, has, you know, a sort of, um, um, you know, rain the impetus, you know, to strengthening uh, resilience, you know, uh, and uh, productive capability for food systems in the continent. Shortages in fertilizer supplies, you know, due to the conflict and increasing fertilizer prices, you know, are gonna lead to, um, you know, um, high levels of food insecurity. Um, we know that countries, for example, countries like Rwanda, you know, have noted this and are investing in fertilizer factory with the capacity of um, over a uh, hundred thousand metric tons. You know, um, uh, against the annual demand of fifty three thousand. And we also know that you know, for example, Nigeria has now has a fertilizer plant. But the challenge with that is that um, practically eighty five percent of what the plant produces for the next four years will be exported out of the continent. The rest will just be for the Nigerian market, you know, and, and that's actually going to mean a lot. It means that prices will rise high because there will be hoarding of fertilizers, you know, within the next um, uh, 18 months uh, due to this crisis. Because one of the things we, we know now is that, we now note is that um, uh, the impact of this crisis is not necessarily being felt as at this time. But within the next six months, when we get to the planting season, that's where the crisis will actually hit very hard. Uh, and that's because farmers are no longer, particularly smallholder farmers, they are no longer using fertilizer because they can't access it. And uh, even if they can, the prices are actually very high. So because of that, there's low use of fertilizer. It means we're going to see um, a decreasing uh, a, a, um, you know, yields um, within the next uh, uh, planting season uh, by the time we get there. Uh, so that's when we, we're going to see, um, you know, um, a, a greater impact of the crisis on food security um, uh, in the continent. You know, some of the short-term measures, you know, to address the conflict, you know, um, that uh, African countries are making include price controls, you know, um, bans, import bans, and of course, uh, import waivers, you know, to allow for increase in, in, in supply uh, to food. Um, finally, let me say here that um, you know, um, uh, for, for as, as, uh, as we conclude this, um, as I, or rather as I conclude my presentation, um, we need to note that African food dependence on imports continue, continues to be a major concern. And, and what that means is that um, going forward, um, the, the import bills are going to rise because production is not rising. Uh, 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 some SMEs are closing down because they can't continue to produce. Uh, and when farmers are, are no longer interested in using fertilizer, that means there'll be decrease in productivity. So import bills will rise, productivity will, will decrease, uh, and that is going to even cause more dependence and uh, increase the debt burden of, of a number of countries. But consumers, partic particularly vulnerable groups, are going to be the ones to suffer most from this. Um, so even though there's been some, uh, you know, increase in food production, uh, but it's at a lower rate um, in some cases, and this is not across the continent, just in a few countries, you know, like South Africa, Nigeria, Zambia, you know, um, uh, and uh, uh, to a certain extent, Ghana, you know, um, but, but population growth is also going to negate all that. Um, and as I said earlier, the, the conflict will further worsen you know, the food security uh, crisis in many African countries because of some of the earlier points I made. There are also major disruptions uh, due to uh, uh, non-tariff measures that are within even the continent, despite the ACFTA, you know, uh, being implemented. The ACFTA remains uh, the Africa Continental Free Trade uh, Agreement. 
um, you know, uh, and cereal supplies are, are becoming, you know, a, a, a very difficult, uh, especially as there's hoarding because the um, marketers are expecting that the price will increase and they are going to make very huge profits. Um, other important inputs such as inorganic fertilizers, you know, which are used in agriculture, you know, could have a multiplier effect, you know, on food production. And finally, there are signs of opportunities with private sector, um, which I earlier talked about the investment in the fertilizer plant. Uh, for example, the, the Dangote uh, fertilizer plant in Nigeria. But like I said, the challenge is that most of its exports are going to go to Europe, to Brazil, you know, and, and to the US. That means that Africa still needs fertilizers and the problems have not been solved. Thank you. Um, Dr. Lafour, thank you so much. Um, and it's, it was a pity that uh, the technology didn't work out as we would like to see. But the semi-final uh, point, other important inputs such as inorganic fertilizer used in agriculture could have multiplier effect. Can you explain a little bit? No, go back to the previous slide, please, slide eight. Could you please explain this one? Will it be um, positive, negative? Slide eight, please. Slide um, eight. It's, it's, it's going to be negative. Uh, I don't know if you can see slide eight here. Yeah? OK. Mm, um, now we can see slide eight, yes. OK, cool. So um, yes, it's going to have a negative uh, 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 effect or impact, rather, because a, a number of the chemicals you know, that are used in, for example, producing the fertilizer blends you know, need to be imported into the continent. Uh, and, um, a, a, you know, a, a, a substantial amount, I think about, uh, you know, 32% uh, um, of, of those uh, um, chemical materials that are required for uh, um, developing and getting the, the fertilizer blends are imported actually from Russia and Ukraine. You know, um, um, you know about, uh, um, you know, 68% is imported from the rest of the world but that's actually going to have an impact because a 32% decrease in access or imports of um, you know, the materials needed for the fertilizer blends means that we're going to have shortages in fertilizer. But it also means that there will be increase in prices of these um, uh, materials you know, uh, and, and uh, fewer companies will be able to access. And where they can access, then the consumers are going to bear the burden, either the governments or the private sector companies who or the, and the marketers who actually want to sell to the farmers. So at the end of the day, the final burden will rest on the smallholder farmer first, who needs the fertilizer, and then on the consumers who need to get food to their dining tables. Yeah. Thank you very much. With this like, extreme important, but also um, alarming conclusion, in the end, the impact of the crisis will first land on the shoulders of smallholders and later on um, uh, the plate of the consumers because they will see increased uh, food prices and the most vulnerable will be confronted the hardest. Thank you so much. We uh, are eager to see your or to get your uh, uh, slides later on also from Dr. Laborde. But now we uh, move on and move forward and we are Extremely happy to hear from uh, Gladys Mugambi. She is the head of nutrition and dietetics at the Ministry of Health uh, in the government of Kenya. And she's a Sun Movement focal point in Kenya. And she is also um, one of the co chairs of our um, executive committee. Gladys, the next five minutes are for you. Thank you very much, uh, Dada, for the chance to share what is happening in the Eastern. Africa. I come from Kenya and uh, the discussions here about the food prices, the fuel prices, and also the issues of uh, being able to access food. So what is happening? I think the presentation which has been made by Apollo has um, brought out the issues around the, the fertilizers and uh, the wheat imports that uh, countries in the eastern part of Africa are actually uh, affected in. So when we talk about wheat imports, uh, our countries have uh, adopted the use of bread and wheat products for their breakfast. And this means that uh, people have to 
give more focus on uh, budgets for this bread and, uh, and other wheat products. And that affects the households and uh, it increases actually the amount of money used on food because of the wheat products which are expensive. And that is already affecting people. When we talk about the, the fuel issues, fuel is used to, to run the vehicles that carry food from one place to another within the country and across the countries in the East, Afri East African region. So again, that affects the, the cost of food at the end of the day, because it's expensive to even put your fuel to go and even purchase food. That is already being felt. If I can talk about the wheat products, bread in Kenya has increased by five shillings, meaning that if you are buying one loaf uh, for your family, then by the end of the, the month, you're going to have to uh, produce 150 Kenya shillings extra. And if we are thinking about the poor families, that is really a big impact because that is just one of the commodities that they need. But again, this affects other commodities because of the issue of transportation of food. And generally in the East African region, especially Kenya where I come from, food prices have gone up because of the transportation issues. So we need to start thinking about what are the alternatives for the, uh, the I mean, to bread or uh, to the wheat products so that as uh, we wait for even the, the recommendations being made that uh, fertilizer should be produced locally and uh, trying to come up with solutions, then we must have uh, uh, ways of helping families to be able to keep their families going with alternative foods. And uh, we also need to start looking for resources from elsewhere to support our people, knowing that we have um, a crisis in terms of a food security already. It's not being brought by the war in Ukraine. It is already existing. And therefore, we need support to be able to take care of our families, take care of the most vulnerable in the areas that are most hit by the drought, where actually bread has been the, the, the main a source of uh, energy for the, for the people. So if we can start thinking about how to help those vulnerable families, countries giving more resources to issues of uh, food security to cushion those families, but also getting donor support so that we do not leave our people who are actually the farmers to suffer. And uh, uh, if I can also still give an example of Kenya, the areas that are most affected are the pastoralist communities from where we get um, the meat that we consume every day. So you can see that if they're affected, then the, the, the other parts of the country will be affected. So in short, there is a, a crisis coming. We are started, we started feeling it. In the next few months, like six months, we might have to have uh, emergency situations whereby families may require to be supported in order to survive. So that's what I can share, given that the facts have already been given by the presentation that was made earlier. I think we're just now thinking of how then do we move forward? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Gladys. So to put it in perspective, um, Food prices are already on the rise, um, impacting family, the poorest and the most vulnerable, uh, the first. Um, in the very much in the also in the remote area, uh, pastoralist uh, communities, um, they are to deliver the um, the, the the meat that is uh, also part of your uh, diet, etc. So where do you see, not only in Kenya, but also in Eastern Africa, where do you see potential solutions for the short and medium term, for, uh, uh, term, for instance? Do you have any um, perspectives, uh, Gladys, to give, to share? Yeah, uh, one of the 
the solutions, first of all, that is uh, immediate is for people to start learning to use other alternative foods that are available for their breakfast or for their meals. Where, where bread has been used more, we can now start transiting to using potatoes, the arrow roots, the indigenous uh, uh, tubers that uh, we have in our countries. And also we can uh, start now teaching the, the families to start thinking about that. But on, in long term, we may require support because this is a problem that may worsen with time. So we may need countries to start putting in resources, results for the foods that are available so that we are able to take care of the families when the crisis worsens. So those are the two that I can talk about for now. And yeah. also donor support can be useful to us. Yeah, I um, we will keep it uh, right now, but later on I will ask you the question and how are you making people aware um, what potential uh, alternatives uh, are? Do you use broadcasting? What kind of communications, uh, schools, uh, hospitals, uh, uh, shops, what have you? But I will ask the question, uh, we will ask the question later because now we first go and, and hear from Mary Prairie. Uh, she is the Sun Movement Focal Point in Ghana. And not only the Scaling Up Nutrition Movement Focal Point, she is also the convener of the food systems dialogues, and she's very much also leading on the implementation of the food systems pathway um, in uh, uh, Ghana. Mary, you have the floor for the next minutes. Thank you very much uh, for having me. I hope you can you can hear me. Loud and clear. Yes, great. Um, so just as has been um, explained, Ghana also imports about 26% of its wheat and 27% of its fertilizer requirements from Russia, uh, with Ukraine supplying about additional 3% of fertilizers. So we also depend on imports, food imports such as rice, fish, meat, wheat, and many other food items. The, um, the wheat is mainly used for bread. About 80% of the wheat is used for bread. So like Kenya, we also have adopted the habit of having, you know, bread for breakfast. And so, and then 20% for other pastries. Uh, trade between Ghana and Russia with respect to especially the export of cocoa beans and other cocoa products is valued at about $69.6 million, whilst Ghana's import of wheat, nitrogenous fertilizers and mixed chemicals are valued at $85.2 million. As we all know, the prices of fertilizers has increased, I mean, globally uh, since 2021, it has increased at about 142%. Um, energy prices have doubled, fuel prices have doubled. Just between five, um, February and March this year, it's moved from five Ghana cities per liter to 10.4, uh, cities per liter. Grain prices have also increased, obviously. Um, wheat by 37% and maize by 21%. Food in inflation stands at 22.4 in as of March, compared to 17.4 in February. So you can see that it's a very steep uh, climb. And a lot of the staples that we have have recorded inflation rates that are actually higher than the national average. So what is happening is that um, a lot of the these food price when food prices increase, of course we all know that poverty levels increase. Also, if a family spends more on food, it shows that poverty is deepening in the family. We naturally farmers are going to stop using fertilizers that will lead to low productivity and they are likely to shift into crops that do not need fertilizers. So that's also uh, going to affect our food security. Um, we are expecting that there will be shortage of cereals and grains and that um, over, although we have uh, the planting for food and jobs and that has actually helped with our food security uh, we, we expect that because of the increase in fertilizer 
and the price hacks, uh, it, it will be a disincentive to the youth that we have been encouraging to get involved in agriculture. So we have to find some incentive mechanisms to make, make them stay the course. So uh, we also know that because especially for imported food, the, 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 the prices are going to triple. So consumption of some food items, you know, people may just shift to other. And then of course, there's going to be worsening livelihoods for uh, uh, people, especially those who are in the food sector. Now, when it comes to uh, West Africa generally, I think that um, there, is, there is a lot of food insecurity, uh, both moderate and severe. So if you look at the structural issues that we have, like the, the economics, the slowdowns and downturns, dependence, dependence on commodity exports, and then the tax, poor tax revenue, poverty and inequality, conflicts, displacements, climate variability, and the, uh, which the, these actually undermine efforts to reduce hunger and malnutrition. Now to talk about the disruption of economic and livelihood activities by co the COVID pandemic uh, in sectors such as tourism, remittances, uh, et cetera. So this, you, we have countries facing debt distress. We have these pandemic debts, disrupted trade flows, volatile credit ma uh, markets, which means that you cannot borrow as easily as you used to. And then also very small fiscal space for investments. And then the, coupled with the need to mobilize more domestic resources. In fact, in Ghana, in spite of all these price hikes, we've had more taxation. I don't know whether you heard about the e-levy controversy where people were really fighting to prevent that from happening. But it has happened because we have no choice but to mobilize more resources uh, internally. So um, the question is, so is nutrition part of the response that is being envisaged? The Ministry of Agriculture has this preliminary ideas that they have shared with us. The idea is to rapidly expand food production and put in place buffers. We do have a buffer facility, but I think that we are not able to mobilize as much as of the production uh, to keep in, in the buffer facility. So that's something we have to keep an eye on. Of course, you are thinking about import substitution like many others, promotion of increase of uh, production and use of organic fertilizers, uh, promotion of substitutes for grains, such as the use of composite flour, it's actually be, it's something that has been experimented with for several years, but I think that now people will show interest because you, if, if you don't take that alternative, you will have to buy the wheat uh, bread at a very expensive price. So we have that mix, which is cassava flour, corn flour, and sweet potato flour. So that's an alternative that we have already. And we are also going to safeguard our domestic vegetable oils like palm oil, palm kernel oil, coconut oil, soybean oil, and, and, uh, um, and then industry and value chain. We are also regulating grains exports for obvious reasons. Not too long ago, we had middlemen coming into Ghana, buying off almost every grain they could find on the market, and our poultry sector suffered as a result. And so uh, there's the need to also regulate that so that we do not find ourselves at the short end of the stake. There's also going to be monitoring of prices, input, food and input prices closely to pick early warning signs of food crisis in order to take from to remedial actions. Um, the preliminary discussions- Mary, 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 let me interrupt you here because you're doing great, but you at the same time make a little bit of noise with your papers uh, close to your micro. So please move on, but tell your papers to be silent. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so um, the sense that we are getting from the Ministry of Agriculture is that, of course, uh, as long as we ensure that there's food security, there is uh, availability, and access, then nutrition issues will be taken care of um, um, as a matter of course. But of course, we have a, I, we have a different opinion. 
we think that it should be part of the response because food security does not automatically translate into positive nutrition outcomes. We all know that. First, production must target more nutritious foods. Uh, we need to have equitable distribution so that people can really have, can have real access, especially to healthy diets and vulnerable populations also must be targeted. Um, livelihood support for poor households. When uh, the COVID uh, pandemic happened, a lot of households actually lost incomes and we're just building back, bouncing back. And then this comes again. So these poor households ought to be really be targeted, especially women who produce the bulk of our food crops. We are talking about urban poor populations and already we have a comprehensive food security and vulnerability analysis study, which was uh, done in 2020, which identified 3.6 million food insecure people in the country, about 60% of them in different uh, ecological, the savanna ecological regions. So we need to target also um, vulnerable populations such as pregnant and lactating mothers, girls and children with social protection interventions so that we do not roll back the few gains that we have made um, post uh, pandemic. We expect that production contraction would be especially more among uh, women for obvious reasons, because traditionally they don't get access to fertilizers already, extension information and all of that. And so women farmers especially, and then when they are in dire straits, they can sell off all their, their food and can go hungry. And so we need to really keep an eye on this particular population. Sometimes, especially in the north of our country, some of the uh, coping strategies that are adopted in the face of dwindling incomes include shifting, of course, to less nutritious foods, reduction in meals uh, regularity, and drop out of girls. Sometimes girls have to drop out and go and work in order to supplement household income, lost household income. And we want to avoid that as much as possible, especially when the country is investing in secondary, free secondary education. We want to make sure that girls take advantage of that. So we also think that vulnerability of women and girls to hunger and malnourishment will translate into maternal death, delivery of low birth weight children who might not develop adequately during the first thousand days and continue the vicious cycle of malnutrition. So we will, we will lead to complete reversal, of, which will lead to the reversal of things. So we do not think that we should shelve nutrition. It's not going to happen automatically. And therefore we are going to engage around that. And we think that the global decision makers to ensure that nutrition is included in the response especially in crafting support for countries. It should not wait. It must be on the front burner because we all know that improving food security, which seems to be the emphasis of most countries, is not automatically going to translate into good nutrition outcomes uh, for us. We also know that uh, post-pandemic debt distress is there. A lot of countries are actually uh, we have to, in Ghana, we have had to cut our budgets, uh, sector budgets by 20%. So there are austerity measures, uh, fiscal space is dwindling, and governments need to fund social programs. So how do we get all of those done? We need the nutrition, uh, nutrition to be included in the recovery packages to prevent the rollback of modest gains that we have made. On that note, Thank you very much. I had a lot of slides, so I wanted to finish very quickly. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Mary. Um, and thank you all, because these all four contributions are extremely rich, giving the facts um, as they are right now, building already on the uh, impact on food and nutrition security of many, especially the vulnerable and with a specific impact, negative impact on women. Uh, and people are trying to bounce back, coming a little bit, finding a little bit their feet uh, again after COVID-19 and other related challenges. And now on top, we have the uh, doubling or tripling of uh, the prices and we all know who will be the victims. 
Um, nutrition cannot be on the back burner. It needs to be uh, upfront uh, with a special attention to women, farmers, uh, pregnant and, and, and uh, lactating women, but also girls because the dropout of girls uh, at schools because they need to contribute to the household income is also alarming. I didn't hear it before, but it's really, really, really alarming. Now, um, dear participants, thank you very much to all the panelists. Um, they will be here, but uh, now we go to you. And we have focused a little bit on the situation in Africa, but the Sun Movement is all over uh, the place. So I would like to see whether we have also participants from uh, Asia and uh, from Latin America, Sun Movement stakeholders who could take the floor and share their perspectives and could it be already also focus a little bit on how in their country they anticipate um, a, a, a crisis and how do, do they prevent um, the, the, the hard impact? Um, so let me go to the Q&A and I can see uh, Catherine Ogden, she is UN Nutrition Secretariat. And uh, we have Barbara Ray Binder. So the first is I support uh, Mary's comments that nutrition should be part of the response. How will the stakeholders and sectors come together to ensure that this happens not only in Ghana, but across the whole continent? Thank you, uh, Catherine Ogden. And then the crisis is terrible and unfortunate, but it's a symptom, symptom of uh, more structural problems in our global food system. Overdependence on food fertilizers, agree. I wonder if everyone can speak about what needs to change structurally to mitigate the impact of such crises in the future. Barbara Ray Binder, um, um, both are at the global secretariat, one of UN nutrition and one of civil society. And I would like to, um, um, to hear from the panelists, but I also would like to see whether we can have somebody speaking from the country uh, one of the Asian countries or one of the Latin America countries. Can you please raise your hand? There is a little bottom, uh, button um, right in your uh, screen. Um, and I would like to look around when, whether somebody would take the floor. Um, but let me first go to uh, Dr. Um, uh, uh, Nafour to answer this question what needs to happen um, in the African uh, region, but also globally to mitigate and anticipate um, the, um, the biggest potential uh, risks. You have two minutes for this answer, Dr. Mafour, and then we go to Dr. Laborde, and then I'll see whether there are more questions. Dr. Mafour, you have the floor. You're still muted. You're muted, you need to unmute your micro. Dr. Nafour, Dr. Apollos Agra, please unmute yourself. Today, luck is not at his site, I'm afraid. Dr. Uh, Laborde, oh, sorry, let us- Sorry, uh, can you hear me now? Can you hear we me can now? hear you now, yeah. Okay, apologies for that, for the technology. So I, I think on, on a structural basis, first of all, uh, countries will need to um, uh, rethink uh, some of um, the, the policies around, you know, um, uh, um, uh, uh, trade and, um, uh, and, and production. So for example, the unnecessary policy impredictability that we're seeing, you know, around trade um, within the continent is is having a negative impact, you know, on food security. So to address this crisis, countries will need to be much more, um, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, deliberate about taking an evidence-based approach to uh, uh, to advancing policy predictability. Second, um, I, I mean, and and before I get into second, I, just to to buttress that point, one of the challenges we saw, which for for us in Agra that we had to deal with was the fact that during the COVID period, you know, there were lots of unnecessary bans. There were huge food waste because at the borders, people were spending about, um, you know, uh, 24 days just to cross, you know, over because of a lot of uh, uh, on 
unnecessary bans uh, and or non-tariff measures that governments had placed, you know, um, across borders. And that had an impact on trade, that had an impact on food security. Um, that's one. The second is that, you know, we need to consider how we are looking at um, uh, uh, driving technologies, you know, um, within our countries. And this means that we need to look at, you know, for example, technologies that support uh, increasing production, technologies that support smallholder farmers to access, you know, inputs like fertilizers and seeds, you know, uh, and the nutrition ones in particular, like Mary was saying earlier around, we, we shouldn't neglect nutrition, you know, in response to the crisis, you know. Um, I, and what that means is that we, 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 we actually need to ensure that, you know, um, the, 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 there is improved farmer registration that governments are able to access, you know, uh, these farmers with a lot of these technologies, including seed varieties that increase production and ensure that we're reducing uh, dependence on, on imports. Uh, the third is around resilience, building resilient systems. And what that means is that um, a, 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 the, the shocks are going to continue. You know, it's not like this is just a one-off issue. Uh, COVID has taught us a lesson. Now, uh, that may sound very crude, but I, I think that's the truth. Uh, and uh, building resilient food systems is going to be very important. We know that after the food system summit last year, countries were asked to develop their food systems pathways. Now, those food systems pathways that um, I think about 112 countries globally have developed out of that 112 uh, 23 of them are in Africa. One of the things that needs to happen is that they need to build in resilience into those country level pathways, resilience to deal with economic shocks, to deal with, you know, uh, price shocks, you know, and the others. And that means that we, we need to be much more strategic as we support these governments by taking a macroeconomic approach uh, uh, to dealing with resilience, you know, and, and right. some of these shocks. Right. I'll, I'll leave it there. Yeah. Thanks. Um, Dr. Mafor, I guess that you as AGRA will share direct recommendations with um, the countries you're active in. Um, because you're dealing, are, are these points that you're making right now, are these parts of the recommendations you are uh, giving to your country or is this part of your support? So these are part of recommendations and the support that we offer. Um, I mean, you give me two minutes, so I had no, to no, summarize. No, 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 but that's, that's enough. <laughs> the, the answer is, yeah. is, um, is, is, is an excellent uh, one. Thank you for this. Yeah. And we need to do a Thank little you. bit of moderation. Eh? Otherwise, because I want to hear from the participants. Um, Dr. Laborde, um, please come in also with what can be done, um, uh, uh, what can be done as soon as possible and on the longer, uh, on the longer term. And there's also a question of whether debt relief will, uh, could, uh, could be part of the solution. Yes, th thank you for, for the, the two points. Uh, but first, I will start with a bit of optimism. Focus, come a little bit closer yes. to your micro, uh, sir, okay. because we okay. want to hear every single word of you. Okay, so, um, no, so I, I want to start by a bit of optimism in the sense that even if we are in a crisis, we are in a much better shape to deal with this crisis than 30 years ago or even 20 years ago. Uh, I mean, poverty has been reduced. Uh, malnutrition was much more extreme, you know, 30 years ago. Just imagine if we had this type of shock on the wheat markets uh, when uh, India or even Bangladesh was much, much more dependent on, on um, external source than, than today. So just to say that we have to put things in perspective. And even as today, for most African countries, the situation is still better than in 2008, for instance. So just to, you know, to not <laughs> panicking everyone. Now, uh, what can be done? I mean that the point made by Apollos is actually, I think, a critical one, is in the last even 10 years, productivity in Africa has not increased as quickly as what we need to deal with the demographic pressure and even the rise of income and the need of diet diversification. And so productivity is key. And productivity will still require also a mineral fertilizer. 
And there is no organic fertilizer versus mineral fertilizer. There is an integrated strategy to increase productivity, but that should be the top and absolute priority. And I will even say, don't care about your food import bill. Don't care about your food dependency. The question is, do your farmers are productive? Do they have good income? And that should be the question every day and not do I spend more on my import or not? Because what you spend in your import is the consequences of other problems. And that should be the focus, you know? So really about keeping policymakers focused on what is the source of the problem and how we address it in terms of lack of access to technology, lack of access to input, but also um, I think as Gladys was mentioning, the fact that even along the value chain, you want to promote diversification, you know? You can do bread with wheat, maybe you want to eat less bread, but you can also start to do bread with a mix of wheat and cassava in some places, in terms of wheat and uh, flour from barley or sorghum in other places. So also think that the food system is not just on the farm uh, and you want to bring information and technology along. And last but uh, not least on this depth aspect, I think here it's critical for the global uh, community, uh, especially for the most vulnerable countries. We cannot just add them to get indebted to survive through the crisis more and more. I know that's not going to be so easy to, to do, uh, but we have already a debt crisis in Africa. Some of the African countries actually, because also you know, the price of copper is up, the price of oil is up. So some African countries will have resources to deal with the current situation, I would say internally. And it will be first of all, an internal dialogue. You know, What do we do with this natural resources money? But all the African countries doesn't have this boon, okay? And they will need support. And uh, just making a loan to help them to go through the crisis will not help because we still also have all the SDG agenda. So the goal is not just to survive through the crisis, uh, but to continue long-term investments. And so I would say, yes, debt relief has to be part of the package. And at one point we have to be honest about, you know, what is the capacity of this country to pay back their debt? It's not to make a free lunch, but it's what we call global solidarity and we have to acknowledge it. Thank you very much. Um, what I hear from you is be concerned about the food price uh, rises and the potential impact, but focus your solutions on the question, can farmers be productive? Can, um, uh, can they get a decent income? And how do we diversify our diet and uh, the food that we uh, produce? Um, and how do we improve this food production? So this is what I would like to, um, to say, maybe with a specific attention also to women farmers and uh, women in the whole uh, uh, game. Um, I would um, also focus, I would also emphasize what you said about debt. Many countries are already, have already a high uh, burden of debt related uh, costs. Um, country governments need to be able to invest in their own uh, food production, but also in their own socio-economic uh, development. Now, I have on the Q&A um, a, um, a comment from uh, Munawar Hussain. Munawar Hussain is from Pakistan. He's de describing the situation over there. Uh, Munawar, I would like to... Um, Mr. Munamar, I would like to give you the floor. Are you ready to give the floor and give your uh, reaction on what, from your perspective, should happen in Pakistan and what can other countries uh, learn from you? And then we go to Gladys because I told Gladys to come back to the question. Mr. Munawar, um, please try to find your um, Bram. Um, I don't know uh, what it is. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah thank, you, uh, thank you so much. I would be more specific to Pakistan with the, the current scenario and the situation. There is one climatic factor that has uh, impacted the uh, reduction in the yield in Pakistan. 
and uh, there are other contributing factor but primarily the climatic change and the early heat wave have actually uh, disturbed the wheat crop and the production and the yield per hectare has reduced in pakistan and he, uh, the wheat is at the is the major staple crop and it is estimated but yet the final impact has yet to be assessed but it is estimated that nearly 10% of the total wheat uh, crop has uh, reduced uh, the, the the total production and another important uh, uh, impact is that uh, pakistan over the last few years was importing the uh, 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 wheat uh, some of the additional wheat from the ukraine which in the current scenario and the uh, current crisis in the region does not seem possible uh, so uh, pakistan need to now take some immediate measures and uh, these measures of course uh, could be a short term long term and the uh, a, a medium term and uh, long term measures one important area that may be a policy action that need to be taken by government of pakistan could be uh, that uh, 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 the uh, whole wheat grain promotion could be a very useful nearly 10 to 15% of the uh, wheat bran is removed to produce the refined flour and that is the, the nutritious part of the wheat bran as well and a promotion of the whole wheat grain would significantly uh, help in reduction of this part. And on the other side, Pakistan also need to uh, continue promoting uh, multi-grain floors and alternative uh, 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 food options as well. So that is uh, uh, some, some suggestion and contribution from my side. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for raising your uh, hand. I would like to invite others to do the same because we would like to hear from uh, maybe also from Latin America, though people might still uh, be asleep uh, over there. But thank you so much for uh, speaking up and uh, speaking um, speaking out on this short-term uh, needs, but also find and invest in alternatives that can be produced and used uh, within your own uh, country. Then we go to um, uh, Mary. Mary, how do you, um, sorry, uh, Gladys. Gladys, how do you roll out this awareness um, of uh, using alternative uh, products for not only breakfast, but for all uh, meals? How do you set up the campaign? Back to you, Gladys. Thank you once again. Um, awareness creation is really key in helping us to achieve good nutrition. And uh, in Kenya, we have been working around, uh, first of all, analyzing our food so that we know what nutrients are in there. We have a food composition table. We've come up with recipes that um, uh, people can use and we put that online so that people can access the recipes using the locally available foods. And we've started engaging media and uh, we want to come up with programs that has not happened yet, but we are planning to have programs whereby we explain how people should uh, mix these foods that has come up so that we diversify how to get the new foods to the plate, the, pl the foods that we are not used to and how to feed our children that has been developed quite a bit and we are able to teach our women at the health facilities through media and one-on-one -on -one engagement between nutritionists and uh, the clients. So it is uh, a, a, an approach that would help us actually change behavior and adopt new habits and also be able to understand what nutrition is all about. So sometimes we talk about it, but people do not understand what you're saying. Uh, the previous presenters just said about uh, the use of uh, wheat bran to feed the animals, when we should be using it to actually feed ourselves first. So we should ensure that as we take care of the animals, we're also taking care of ourselves first. So all this uh, is through the media, is through our health facilities, and community engagement, engaging the various uh, uh, people to do this. And then lastly, we have a, a program where we 
we want to see that the children are learning about this in school so that as they grow up, they're able to adopt good habits. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. We have um, now, and I go come back to uh, uh, Mary, but we have Shishai Hailu um, who has a question. Shishai, can you, are you able to take the floor? Can I invite you? Shishai. Let us give it the floor. Let us give it a try. Shishai, are you able to take the floor? Yes. There we are. Shishai, please. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah okay. Thank you. Um, thank you for the presenters and, and uh, for this uh, big discussion. Speak close to the micro and uh, tell me what is your, tell us what is your background? In which country are you and are you one of the stakeholders? Okay, just uh, my name is Shishai. I'm uh, working for South Sudan. I'm uh, just working for the UN network. Um, we were supposed to have the presenter from uh, the government, but they are not able to attend this. So I'm from South Sudan, uh, representing the UN network. So just my question is uh, simple, but very important. I feel it's very important. Taking the current situation where we are being and uh, the, uh, the solutions we are suggesting and the current uh, uh, crisis, which is uh, in Ukraine and uh, Russia, at global perspective, what do we expect? Uh, are we expecting the trend, the impact trend to be continued with, with the one which we are doing in terms of um, coping mechanisms? What do we expect uh, from the global perspective? What are we learning from? Thank you, and over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to ask this to Dr. Laborde and Dr. Marfour uh, very soon. Um, but first, um, no, very, very, uh, very brief. What do you expect? What are the what are the short term and the medium term expectations that you have right now, Dr. Laborde? Please. So, um, I mean, what's going to take place everywhere in the world is that farmers will start to adjust their uh, decision in terms of what to plant uh, and uh, also um, what amount of input they are going to put. So, and I will say that also the virtue of being in a globalized world, because we have two hemispheres and we have two planting seasons by hemisphere. So instead to have to wait, you know, one year to start to see um, some adjustment in some of the big producers. We are going to see a lot of um, movement taking place for, uh, in the next two months, then six months, then 12 months, then 80 months. And obviously like this market are going to adjust uh, gradually. Uh, and you know, uh, while people will be planting their winter crops in, in the Southern hemisphere, then we will start to harvest the, the winter one from the previous one, then you feel the spring. So that's really, how we manage risk globally. I mean, that what I start to get for it is when I see every country want to do things on its own uh, because that will not work. You know, we have seen that climate shock uh, are still important. Morocco is going to be part of our production this year. We just have the example of Pakistan. So at one point we need to share the risk globally in particular with more um, the, the climate situation we are in and that's not going to disappear tomorrow. Uh, but this being said, so the world is going to adjust. Now, of course, uh, how long the, the war is going to continue in Ukraine and what it means for energy and fertilizer markets, that is going to have uh, a significant impact. What I think is, so let's just say the next six months are going to be challenging. Um, and uh, let's make sure that how we address the fertilizer situation will allow us to maintain a strong global food supply next year. And of course, with a local dimension, <laughs> uh, but you know, it has to be balanced. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Marfour, please. Um, I, I think um, we, um, you know, in, in addition to what uh, uh, David has said, I, I think we, um, in, in the short term, um, basically for, for many African countries, it, it might be best to 
um, you know, uh, encourage and ensure that farmers have access to inputs, uh, particularly fertilizers. And that may mean um, taking, in the short term, doing smart subsidies uh, to make sure that smallholder farmers are able to access, you know, uh, inputs like fertilizers and seed varieties, you know, which will then ensure that, you know, um, uh, we're able to increase productivity uh, in the first place. Uh, second is, I think, um, um, you know, uh, as in, in the short term, um, just like uh, we supported during the COVID period, we probably look, need to look at uh, some of the safety nets that are available, you know, to avoid, um, you know, losing the gains we made, you know, in, in driving uh, uh, food security uh, in, in, in these countries. In the medium term, it's important to begin to start, um, you know, taking, uh, looking at key partnerships with private sector. Uh, to actually support um, uh, in, uh, uh, increasing productivity, as well as you know, um, uh, ensure that markets, uh, the disruption that we're we're seeing in markets now is is not going to be, um, you know, too extreme. Uh, and this is where we probably need to look at uh, some of the incentives in the short term, but also looking at uh, uh, partnerships where private sector can come in and support these governments, you know, to open up the markets to increase productivity and ensure that, you know, um, we are uh, achieving price stabilization, you know, right. um, uh, particularly right. for, 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 for these inputs and for food in particular, you know, for, you for the consumer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we are now running to the end of this event, um, but it's extremely inspiring to see that instead of seeing the number of participants going down step by step, uh, we can see the number of participants going up. So thank you very much for uh, being here. I would like to ask uh, Portia Milongo, Miongo to take uh, the floor because she, I think it's a she, has, an, uh, has one uh, important uh, remark. Portia, are you able to take the floor? Right, thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Who are you? Do you have a camera so that we can see also your face? <laughs> yes. All right, so I was not prepared to come up and actually speak uh, with my okay. face. I do apologize for that. Yeah. Um, I'm in a different time zone. Um, okay. I'm a teacher by profession. And um, the reason I, I got to find out about this webinar, I was looking for a theme uh, to do for the Africa Day on the 25th of May. Anyway, and then just to cut the story short, a lot of what we do in the classroom, I always find is very distant to what is needed outside. And so me being a teacher, being a lifelong learner, I'm coming to these platforms to find authentic real problems that I can take back to my kids and say, hey, listen, this is what is happening. And then let's just try and brainstorm ideas and solutions to it. However, I feel like, you know, that can go a long way if governments or you know, private sectors really do invest in curriculum design for such programs so that the teachers are equipped and then students have the enough resources for them to actually practice this. And this becomes part of their everyday schooling because it is a right, it is right for kids to know how to make and actually grow their own food. I think it will help us a lot, especially uh, where we come from in Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Portia. From which country are you? I'm originally from Soweto, South Africa, but I'm currently working in Beijing, China. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining. You're indeed in a different time zone, and it's and we are extremely grateful that you have spoken up and spoken out. Um, Gladys um, and Mary, uh, I would like you to reflect on this, and that is these are the, the, the final remarks, then I will make a kind of summary, and then we um, sum up this, uh, this event. First, Mary, and Mary, I also want to hear from you, what is this initiative, Planting for Health and Jobs, that you apparently have in your country? Mary, please. Um, thank you very much. It's uh, Planting for Food and Jobs. Oh, for food and jobs, yes. Okay. Planting, planting for Food and Jobs is actually a large scale. It's a government flagship. And the whole idea was to scale up food production to ensure that we have food security of, with obvious um, uh, impact on um, poor households. So that's, that is something that has, and it is providing a lot of opportunities for especially rural populations 
And we actually enjoyed a lot of, you know, low food prices. That's why we talked about people smuggling and others coming to buy off because their prices were good. Unfortunately, because of the smuggling and then this uh, crisis, we have to rethink what we do and we have to we have to mop up what we have store as much as possible so that like i said earlier on we don't get the short end of the stick but um by way of conclusion i would like to say that this has been a very interesting discussion it will help all of us you know back at home when, when we are sitting at the table we have been well informed uh, what the picture is looking like in africa the need to work, uh, be self-reliant, and the need also to build resilience is very, very important. Uh, the need to look at women, vulnerable groups, you know, to look at alternatives. And I also like the point about the campaign, the communication campaign that should go with this, because it's all about attitudinal change. And, and, and sometimes, like I gave an example, we had this composite flour that is made with available um, uh, crops in Ghana and people were not too excited about it. But hopefully now that bread is very expensive, they might take a second look at it. So we need to encourage people to think creatively. I also get the point about innovation, but I, there was a one interesting question about debt relief. I don't think I had any, any <laughs> I, I had any response to that. But one thing I know is that debt relief is not for everybody, I, I understand. Especially for instance, Ghana is middle age, uh, middle, uh, what? Income. Middle income yeah. country now. And therefore we may not even qualify for debt relief. So uh, that's also uh, something that we could uh, talk about. I don't know whether there is a way out of that, but I would like to say um, thank you. And I hope that we can keep this conversation going. I think it shouldn't stop here. We should find ways to engage. Uh, thank you so much, Leda, for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Mary. And for sure we will, because uh, this information and, and listening to you and hearing from your experience and cross-inspiring each other is of immense importance. Um, Gladys, please, and then I make some closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presenters and uh, for the contributions we've got from uh, those who are online. Uh, the issue of uh, food systems has come up. We need to ensure that uh, we are integrating nutrition through the systems from uh, production. When you talk about fertilizer, it should be fertilizer that is going to give us the nutrients that we need in our foods. When we talk about trade, it's about uh, ensuring that uh, even as we move food from one place to another, we ensure that uh, the prices are not going to be too high and also it remains safe for people. We've talked about uh, engaging our children in schools and uh, I'm happy that there's a teacher in the, he, here who is uh, uh, interested in that area. We need to make our children uh, be able to actually understand all these issues so that they participate in uh, changing our world in the future. So thank you very much. The discussions are rich and uh, our partners who have uh, given us even uh, the data on what is happening is that is actually required in every step so that we are able to make decisions using information that is uh, uh, up to date. So thank you all. and. Uh, we hope to meet again for such a discussion. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Gladys. Let me make six uh, closing remarks here. First um, a remark, and that's coming from everyone, the need is, of course, to focus on uh, uh, short-term support, social protection, making sure that people are able to uh, feed themselves. However, an even stronger focus should be on uh, uh, alternatives um, what can be what can be re replacement and what can have the, the same um, uh, nutrition uh, impact um, um, uh, uh, as the, the replacing the wheat? Let's put it like this. 
bread as breakfast, what can be the alternatives, and how to enroll a campaign to make people aware and to support people in uh, dealing with the alternative uh, diets. The next message is that nutrition is not something you can put on the back burner. Don't go back to um, only focus on food security, uh, filling the belly, because we are creating the, uh, the long-term uh, nutrition problems that are impacting the potential of people for the next decades, because impacting the potential of people will impact in a negative way also the potential development of a country. Then when it comes to uh, food production, focus on technology, focus on diversification, focus on job creation, and also the food value chain, um, planting for food and uh, jobs um, don't only focus on uh, the export of commodities, but see whether you can build your own uh, food system. So the next planting season, the next harvest season, but also what is beyond. Look at this at an investment in your own country to be able to create your own uh, solutions. Then on food systems pathways, a strong plea continue to um, implement these 23 in Africa uh, here, but also make sure that you have focus enough on the gender issue, the female farmers, but also the female needs, uh, girls, uh, uh, women, access for uh, women, focus on resilience. Resilience building must be part of the food systems uh, uh, pathways smallholders, remote communities, it was mentioned very often, who is in the end uh, dealing with the most negative uh, impact. It's very often smallholders who are already a lot at risk, but also remote communities. And Gladys was mentioning the pastoralists who are providing, uh, uh, providing a lot of protein rich uh, food and they are needed. Then I think um, I, we heard a strong suggestion on think about building into the school um, uh, curricula uh, to teach children how they can uh, learn to cope with things, how they can anticipate all the challenges that these are there right now. It's about food and nutrition, but there will be more shocks like climate change, like potentially uh, uh, conflicts migration, whatever. So uh, bring in this in the program of school so that children are ready to cope and deal with things, uh, investing in their own resilience. Finally, I heard a point on debt relief. Um, we saw already in the chat that there was a focus on it and there was a clear question, fine, but then uh, please find also ways for middle income countries that are um, um, uh, that have uh, problems and that are also uh, uh, involved in in uh, or in debt uh, uh, more should should we also think about finding concrete solutions for these countries because the need for the government to continue to be able to invest in their own future in their own society communities um, and the own uh, development is a crucial one. With this, I would like to bring this to a close. Um, we are extremely grateful to all participants, but also to the panelists and to the organizers behind the scenes, because it's very often a lot of heavy lifting. We will make sure that there is a, a clear connection between this event and what will we will feed in in the global uh, crisis and response group, where there is also that is also dealing with um, uh, food amongst uh, other things like fuel and uh, and finance, and that will try to influence the outcomes of G7, G20, World Bank uh, meetings, UN General Assembly, um, uh, African uh, Union maybe, uh, but also. Give us your voice, uh, speak up and speak out like participants this, did in this uh, event. This is what the Sun Movement is uh, about. It's um, using the power of we and it's focusing on the voice and the needs and the support to countries. With this, I would like to bring this event to a close. Thank you so much. The recordings will be shared and the presentations will be shared. So please stay tuned. All the best. Thank you.